Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the HPTN 073 Prep Uptake and Use of Black Men Who Have Sex with Men in 3 U.S. Cities webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Should you wish to ask a question during the presentation, please use the chat feature located in the lower left corner of your screen. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press star zero. As a reminder, this conference has been recorded today, Tuesday, March 1, 2016. I would now turn the comments over to Mr. Christopher Huck Ortiz. Please go ahead. Uh, yes. Um, hello, and thank you all for uh, joining us this morning. Um, this morning, I am very uh, pleased to be able to um, introduce to you all um, um, uh, Doctors uh, Daryl Wheeler, uh, Dr. Sheldon Field, and Dr. Lebron Nelson, all of whom were members of the leadership for HPTN uh, 073. Um, I myself am currently the chair of the HPTN Black Caucus, and so what I'd like to then do is um, um, highlight again very quickly uh, Dr. Daryl Wheeler, who is the protocol chair for the HPTN 073 study protocol. He also was a co-chair on HPTN 071. Um, and Dr. Wheeler is uh, Vice President for Public Engagement and the Dean of Social Welfare at the University of Albany and SUNY, which is up in New York. Uh, we'll also be joined by uh, Dr. Sheldon Fields, who's a protocol co-chair for HPTN 073. Um, Dr. Fields is currently the Dean and Professor of the Mervyn M. Dimely School of Nursing here at Charles Drew University of Medicine and Science in the Los Angeles area here in Los Angeles, California. Um, and then uh, Dr. Laron Nelson. Uh, uh, Dr. Nelson is the Associate Director of International Research uh, at the Center for AIDS Research at the University of Rochester. Um, and Dr. Nelson uh, provided his expertise in the shaping of uh, parts of the intervention for AIDS. HPTN 073. Um, what I, I'd like to mention that um, there will be, we will be tweeting live. So if you see here on the front slide, you'll see the two hashtags, HPTN 073 or PREP for Black MSM, BMSM. Um, those, uh, those tweets will be uh, ongoing throughout the, um, throughout the hour. And again, if you do have any questions, um, use the, uh, the chat feature for any questions as all lines will be muted uh, for, this, uh, for the duration of the, uh, of the, of the program. So moving forward, um, I'd like to introduce you all to sort of the, so the, the, the course of the morning will provide an overview of the HIV Prevention Trials Network, um, an introduction to HPTN 073. Um, we'll then go on to talk about some of the study findings and then some of the conclusions um, that uh, we're making from the, uh, the data from HPTN 073, and then uh, provide the opportunity for some answers and questions and answers. Um, and now I'll go on and move into the rest of the slides um, for this exciting uh, protocol. So very quickly, um, let me provide an overview of the HIV Prevention Trials Network. The HIV Prevention Trials Network is a worldwide collaborative of clinical trials. Um, it's a network that in involves uh, investigators, ethicists, community, and other partners um, at a global scale. Um, that uh, test uh, interventions and um, protocols to prevent the acquisition and transmission of HIV. Um, HP and HPTN studies are uh, often used to evaluate new prevention interventions and methodologies and strategies uh, for populations and uh, various geographic regions where uh, there's a disproportionate burden of uh, HIV infection. The network includes over 40 sites in more than 15 countries. Um, and as you can see here, if you look at this, um, what we've highlighted is all of the countries in the, uh, in the world where the HPTN sites, um, either sites or study pro protocols are, are currently uh, being run. So um, it's quite an extensive network. And that provides the context for uh, the HPTN 073 trial. When you look at the full portfolio of research that's done through the uh, HIV Prevention Trials Network, um, what you'll see is that um, you know, there are studies that are done uh, that are look at communities across HIV status, so uh, both for people who are 
currently HIV negative and how do we keep people uninfected? Um, how do we address uh, identifying people when they're in acute infection and then also for people with established infection? So things like treatment as prevention is a, uh, an, an, an approach that we address in the HIV prevention trials network. Um, we look at, uh, we have studies that look at different populations, both, uh, you know, globally, both adolescents, men who have sex with men, um, transgender women, uh, cisgender women, injection drug users, and other communities, again, where there are disproportionate impacts of HIV uh, um, in those uh, areas. And then, um, you know, and the various types of interventions that we do within the network um, include things such as uh, different types of behavioral prevention. Um, uh, different protocols will often include HIV testing. Um, we obviously have provided an opportunity to do different types of tests using uh, PrEP, um, uh, as well as ART. Um, male circumcision is another intervention that uh, the network has explored, as well as substitution or antagonist therapy uh, for substance use, um, as well as uh, behavioral economics or financial incentives, and also looking at combined or integrated strategies, which takes pieces of different types of these different intervention approaches and combines them together to try to leverage uh, the broader impact in the, in the community. Um, as far as the types of studies go, as you'll see, um, you know, we do a various different uh, variety of types of studies, including um, implementation science and uh, randomized and community randomized trials. Okay. So at, at this point, I'm sorry, I was going to say at this point I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Sheldon Fields. Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for joining us. I'm going to provide us with the uh, study overview for HPTN uh, 073. The need for the study is really rooted and based in the epidemiology of the epidemic in which black men who have sex with men remain at a disproportionate risk of acquiring HIV infection. While black men who have sex with men only comprise 0.4% of the entire U.S. population, they make up more than 20% of all new infections amongst um, MSM in 2013. While we had such studies such as IPREP that gave us proof of concept that PrEP could work in MSM populations, there were very few black MSM in the IPREC study to really draw any definitive conclusions about the specifics about how black MSM would uh, uptake and use PrEP. Hence the impotence for designing a study that would talk about how can we effectively use methodologies to deliver this new prevention intervention for the success of black men and sex with men so that we could really put a halt to the HIV infection rates amongst this group. This is the first study that specifically evaluated pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP in a U.S.-based black MSM population sample. The study was designed to be a demonstration project with three sites, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, and Chapel Hill, North Carolina. The original number of men that we were seeking to recruit was 225 across all three sites, so 75 per site. All men were to be offered once daily oral Trivada as PrEP, but they were not necessarily required to take PrEP as a requirement of study, um, of being put on the study. The men in this study had a choice, and that's going to become an important feature once Dr. Wheeler starts talking about what we found in the results. We also knew that designing a study with just telling men to take a pill was not going to work. So we were very fortunate and used some lessons uh, out of HPTN 061 and crafted something called client-centered care coordination, uh, which is an individualized prevention counseling support and, and counseling coordination type uh, system that uh, Dr. Nelson is going to go into more detail about. All of the participants in this study 
were followed for 12 months. I am now going to turn this over to my colleague, Dr. Nelson. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon on the East Coast. I'm going to talk to you about client-centered care coordination. As Dr. Phil mentioned, we knew uh, from other studies that have been done uh, that counseling was important to prep adherence for those folks who decided to take it in those studies such as IPREX. So when we were thinking about HBT 073 and Black MSM, we thought very, very carefully about what was necessary to support Black MSM to be adherent to PrEP if they decided to take it. So we developed C4, which is client-centered care coordination. We conceptualized it as the longitudinal management of client-identified health and psychosocial needs by an interdisciplinary team of people. This was important uh, because it acknowledged the unique experiences that Black MSM have in the U.S. and what it would mean in regard to biomedical interventions such as PrEP, uh, how could we support them to use it if they wanted to, uh, it's taking into account uh, their experiences in the U.S. healthcare system uh, in general, and also psychosocial issues and potential barriers they may have had or currently have to accessing healthcare. As Dr. Fields mentioned, C4 was informed by our research experiences in HBTN061, uh, but as well uh, by existing extensive literature that supported the efficacy and cost effectiveness of using interdisciplinary team-based clinical models uh, for management of uh, uh, longitudinal management of healthcare issues. It also is informed by years of clinical practice experience uh, that was uh, that members of the team had, for example, uh, we had representatives with Jason Medicine, nursing, social work, psychology, counseling, African American studies. All of these came together uh, to really conceptualize what would what would be the best model uh, for trying to support prep use and HIV risk reduction among Black MSN. So C4 is an intensive, individualized, client-centered counseling model for adopting and maintaining. HIV risk reduction behaviors that the clients themselves identify. It is actually a hybrid model that's based on the comprehensive risk counseling and services model. This is an evidence-based public health strategy. Uh, it's not new. Uh, it, we actually, uh, this came from the CDC's Diffusion of Evidence-Based Interventions uh, project. But what we did was take that existing model, because it had some important features, some features we thought were, uh, would be relevant to the work we were going to do in HBT in 073, and then custom designed it for HIV negative black MSM who were at risk, high risk for acquiring HIV, and also uh, to support adherence for HIV negative black MSM who may have decided to use Truvada as PrEP. One of the, the main ways that we custom designed this intervention was to ground it in a theoretical framework. And the theory that we used was self-determination theory. So self-determination theory is a, a social psychological theory of human motivation, which, uh, which acknowledges that there are social cultural factors that can either facilitate or undermine a person's sense of volition or initiative. So volition is, is the sense of choice the sense that something, whatever it is, is not being forced on a person, or that the person maintains autonomy and is, desired, is allowed to choose whatever path they think is best for them or best meets their needs. The assumption under this model is that humans have tendencies towards growing and mastering challenges in their life, including uh, health care, and also integrating new experiences into their a coherent sense of self, whether this is new ways around managing uh, sexual behaviors or incorporation of new risk reduction techniques uh, such as PrEP. The three main components of the theory are autonomy support, which is supporting people's volition or sense of choice, not necessarily independence, but uh, certainly choice is a central feature of that. Competence, which is the sense of mastery that people have support to accomplish whatever goals they have, whether those are goals within the general life or HIV risk reduction goals and also a sense of relatedness, which is that the person who's in front of you, who's counseling you, who's uh, engaged in your care, cares about you 
uh, that it's not simply your job, but the person is genuinely interested in your success to reach whatever uh, HIV risk reduction goals are identified. So these three things were applied uh, within the HBTN 073 and C4 framework to support men to engage in whatever behaviors that they targeted. So this, for some, for many, was the use of PrEP, PrEP initiation, PrEP adherence, uh, and also condom use. Uh, lastly, uh, much of what I think uh, has been heard about C4 has been the care coordination component of it. And so those really are congruent with the theoretical components, competence, and relatedness. What care coordination does is that it supports people to address issues in their life, and the counselor who's involved with that helps people master whatever those challenges are in an effort to support their ability to adhere uh, to whatever their risk reduction goals are. Some of that includes PrEP, uh, but not everybody in the study chose to take PrEP. And it also uh, is one with relatedness in that by engaging in care coordination activities, the counselors, the social workers at the site demonstrated that they cared about the issues that were priority in men's lives. And so these three things together, the care coordination uh, and the counseling is what made up uh, the C4 intervention that was used in 073. Thank and, you, Dr. Uh, Nelson. So one of the things that we were very adamant about, as, as Dr. Nelson uh, uh, talked about, was the fact that in this study, men who were recruited and enrolled had choice. So we, we branded the study, My Life, My Health, My Choice. And we introduced the study in a series of really focused community-based engagement activities and via uh, the internet and a website that really featured this uh, visual campaign that you see in front of you. The other really important thing about 073 was the, the uh, culmination of a dream study team, in my opinion, um, that included myself, Dr. LaRon Nelson, Dr. Leah Wilton, who led the qualitative components, and our fearless leader, uh, Dr. Darrell Wheeler. Um, this was truly a study that was um, on black MSM, designed for black MSM, and led by for black MSM. So to that extent, I will turn this over to Dr. Wheeler, who will tell you about our very exciting study findings and conclusions. Thank you, Christopher Huck Ortiz. Thank you, Dr. Fields. Thank you, um, Dr. Laurent Nelson. And um, Dr. Fields, thank you um, for that wonderful introduction. Um, the characterization of this as a dream team actually is quite true in my estimation. And that dream team extends fluently right through every person, site PI, the stats team, um, the coordination team, the lab team, and certainly the field or the site operational team that made this possible. And of course, none of this could have been done without the men themselves who gave of their time and their commitment. And, and before this is over, I'll, I also want to thank our sponsors um, who saw fit to fund this study and provided instrumental support throughout. Now I'd like to take the opportunity to present some of the early findings. Before I get into the findings, I just want to contextualize the finding results because you may have questions about the findings um, that we can start to speculate on but may not have full answers for you at this point. The study concluded the last site visit was in September of 2015. Between the time period of September 2015, the data are um, are cleaned and locked down in terms of the sites turning in um, forms that need to be done and when we absolutely close all data to any new inclusion. So from the time of December 2015 to now has been the time frame where we've had to look at the data. And some of the questions you may have will be in analysis that are forthcoming. At this point, I'm very happy to report to you some of our early study findings. First, um, as um, desired, we were able to enroll our target number of men, 225 plus one, um, meaning that at one site we had 76 men and at the other two sites we had 75 men enrolled. The age distribution represents a very close um, 
approach to what we sought to achieve, and that was we wanted to make sure we brought men under the age of 25 into the study, recognizing the course of the epidemic. 91 men are un were under the age of 25, 135 over 20, 25 or older. 166 of the men identified as gay and 45 identified as bisexual. There were 74 men who identified a primary or main partner as male and three who identified a primary or main partner as female. And then there were, um, in terms of self-identified African-American or Afro-Caribbean, there were 204 compared to 17 who identified as Afro-Latino and five who identified as other. In our study, we also see that men, as has been said, were able to accept PrEP or not. 79% of the men enrolled across the study sites accepted PrEP. 84% of those accepting PrEP were 20, under the age of 25 compared to 76% 25 or above. 81% on PrEP, uh, accepting PrEP identified as gay compared to 71% as bisexual. And 78% of those accepting PrEP said that they had a primary uh, male partner. Uh, 70, yes, and all three of the men who had a primary female partner um, indicated that they would accept PrEP. 78% um, were African or Afro-Caribbean, 82% Afro-Latino, and 80% of the five were um, on PrEP who said that they were other ethnicity. And okay, next slide. By site distribution, we see that the majority of the men reported that they had some form of health coverage. Now, and of the men in the, on the PrEP, 74% had some prior experience with incarceration. There was a diversity in educational level with 82% of the men accepting PrEP having two or more years of, of of college compared to 18% of the men not on PrEP. When we look at high school or less, 77% um, of the men on PrEP compared to 23% of the men not on PrEP, and those with some college, 77 and 23 again. So again, a diversity of educational background. The income um, education, unlike many other studies, you'll see here in our data, that it represents a rather diverse population, not just tapping into men who very often are reported in studies as having incomes at the lowest levels. We saw a distribution with men accepting PrEP um, more likely to have the higher incomes, 84% of the 51 reporting 50,000 or more compared to 16,000, but still distributions showing that the majority of the men were um, at the single most category under $20,000 at 74% and 26% not on PrEP, and of the men between $20,000 and $49,000 per year, 81% on accepting PrEP and 19% not accepting PrEP. Employment status, what we see is that 66% of the men accepting PrEP um, were reporting unemployed or disability or other compared to 80% had some type of self-employment or part-time employment, and 84% were employed. This, again, contrasted to those men not accepting PrEP. 16% not accepting PrEP were employed full-time compared to 34% who were unemployed, disabled, or other, and again, 16% only part-time employed or self-employed. The PrEP uptake overall, and again, these are self-reported PrEP uptake at this point, um, suggests that the median number of male partners in the prior three months was three. 33% reported a primary partner, and 73% of the men who accepted PrEP indicated that they had a casual male partner or male partners. 96% or 23 of 24 men reporting an HIV primary partner um, in the past period. And um, uh, out of 120 men, 104 of men reporting casual partners said that they were of unknown or HIV positive status. And those are the men accepting PrEP. Those agreeing to take PrEP utilized a median of six 
sessions compared to men not accepting PrEP using a median of four C4 sessions. This graph shows the um, cumulative probability of PrEP uptake over time. So the, <clears throat> I'll use my pointer here. At the point of enrollment for all sites, what you'll see is that there's a fairly rapid uptake of the sites, and then there's a tailing off. <coughs> Excuse me. There are some differences. The triangles indicate UCLA. The circles indicate um, George Washington and the squares indicating the site at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And you see, for example, in the UCLA site, it took a little bit longer to reach the full number of men um, for PrEP uptake compared to the other two sites, with apparently a more rapid uptake occurring at the North Carolina site and the George Washington site being um, in between. But overall, you see that the slope of this moves very quickly. So what, we're, what we saw is that men who were going to accept PrEP accept it relatively quickly compared to those who would not accept PrEP period in the study. In terms of uh, men remaining on PrEP, there is self-reported PrEP adherence. Um, again, the self-reported adherence at or above 50% compared to self-reported adherence at or above 90%. At week number four, we see 85% of the men um, self-reporting at least 50% compared to 67% um, at 90% or better. And this moves over time, 82% at week eight compared to 67% at week eight for those at 90%. At, at week 13, 87%, at least 50% adherence, 70% um, at um, week number uh, 13, 90%. At week 26, we saw 81% and 62%, and at week 39, we saw 85 and 70%. At week 42, which was the terminal week for men being in the study as we followed men for a full year, um, we're seeing still 86% reporting taking um, at at least 50% and 67%. So our overall numbers were relatively strong with men reporting um, through the life of the study, those who are accepting PrEP, at least 70 plus percent adherence um, when we put all the numbers together. And we'll be able to go back um, in the data analysis and look not just at self-reported, but at laboratory confirmation. That data is not available at this time, but we do have those numbers. In terms of seroconversions, there were a total of eight individuals who seroconverted in the life of the study. Five men were those who reported that they would accept PrEP, and three um, occurred amongst those who said they would not accept PrEP. However, of the five individuals, of the five individuals who said they would accept PrEP, and this is out of a total of 178 men who said they would initiate PrEP, we know that two of those men either discontinued or at least reported discontinuing their PrEP at least 50 to 272 days prior to, a, to their serial conversion confirmation test on site. What that means for us is that clearly at the point of um, we tested the men, they could not have had sufficient product in their blood system to be protected, and the men themselves are telling us that they weren't using it. So one might actually classify even those two as not being on PrEP at that particular time. And this again compared to three men who seroconverted um, in terms of those who did not accept PrEP. If you were to take those two men out who reported not being on PrEP, the numbers are identical, and that gives us a, a very different look at the incident rate over um, the life of the study. If you look at visit completion, we had fairly strong completion um, peer, uh, across all of the sites. At week four, right through week 52, you see over 90% um, retention of men who were agreeing to take PrEP, and you see upwards of 70% amongst those men who did not accept PrEP. Overall, the retention in the entire study was 92%, which is a very strong, if, if not um, phenomenal, rate of retention on any study where you follow people for an entire year. So this was very strong retention in our study. 
some of the primary conclusions of this study is that by providing a theory-based, culturally tailored program can potentially increase adherence, support program retention, and prevent HIV among black MSM. And you heard from Dr. Nelson about the details of the um, C4 intervention, and that is the theory-based, culturally tailored program. Our protocol, HPTN 073, demonstrated a high uptake of PrEP with more than at least 78% of the sample of 226 accepting PrEP um, and utilizing C4, and that C4 with a median of six amongst the men who accepted and a median of four of those who did not accept PrEP leads us to believe that the data support that a reduced rate of HIV um, pr um, HIV infection can be promoted when men are brought into PrEP. And these findings really help us to begin to address a vital U.S. public health gap in HIV prevention. Again, continued analyses are occurring. These data that we're sharing with you today were um, first shared last week at the Con um, CROI conference in Boston, and we have a number of um, abstracts under review for the International AIDS Conference, and we'll be submitting others in, in addition to working on primary papers with a much deeper dive into the data. And with that, I want to thank my colleagues for um, leading this presentation. I want to thank our, I think I'm supposed to go here, yes, jo um, Jonathan, do you want to do Q&R before we go into this, or do you want me to go forward at this point? Keep going forward. Okay, thank you. For additional information, you can find us at hptn.org, Facebook, and Twitter, and nih.gov. Our acknowledgments, absolutely, as I said early on, we could not have done this study without the wonderful support um, for the uh, pharmaceutical agent um, from Gilead Sciences and our support financially from NIAID, NIDA, and NIMH. Our colleagues also from CDC, HRSA, SAMHSA providing input and from the HPTN leadership. I'd like to also thank, as I said earlier, the 073 participants, the leadership um, at HPTN, the protocol team, particularly the Black Caucus, and all of the community stakeholders who supported us throughout the life of this study. I now turn it over for questions and responses. Very good, uh, and thank you so much, uh, Drs. Uh, Wheeler, Dr. Fields, and Dr. Nelson for your uh, participation. Um, I'm looking here in the chat box, and there are a few questions that are starting to come in. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll um, read them and then give uh, each of you opportunities to respond. Uh, to any of these items. So the first question that I see here is asking about adherence in the study. And so, for example, what it says is, what does 50% mean with regard to adherence given that uh, there was self-report data? So 50%, it was once a day dosing, so you would look at the number of days that the, um, between the point that the man said that he was going to start and how many days he would have been on Truvada or the product at that moment in time. And again, this is self-report. And so if it, if it were a 10-day period, it would be five out of the 10 days, at least once a day dosing. We do have plasma um, um, dry blood samples that we will be analyzing to look for the actual um, product in the bloodstream to confirm and to compare to self-report. But at this initial stage, it really is about his self-report of how frequently he was taking once a day dosing. Excellent. Thank you. Um, let's see, another question here. Um, I, uh, I'm not sure exactly which slide it's referring to, but it's, uh, the question is asking about percentages. It says uh, it, the adherence percentages seem fairly high. Um, it was, so it's kind of a question and a statement. Um, again, the percentages, um, when, when one characterizes the percentages of being high, I think there's a subtext there that the percentages should be low. Um, I, would, I would probably suggest that the C4 intervention 
helped men to make critical decisions. Remember, men were not required to be on PrEP. Men could accept PrEP at any point in the study up until week 39, uh, to week 48, and that the C4 interventionist and part of the entire design was made to create an environment that the man could make a decision about when it was right to go on to PrEP, and going on PrEP, he was assisted in developing a plan that would help him to maintain adherence. So the whole study is oriented to creating optimal adherence once a person stays on. So in fact, for us, the numbers are very encouraging. And again, the confirmatory data um, will give us much more insight as to the veracity of those, uh, of those self-reports. Excellent. Thank you. Um, let's see, here's another question um, that is asking about um, the degree to which, okay, so um, were study volunteers informed that the study was uh, created by African American MSM um, and designed and developed uh, and led by African American MSM? And if so, how did this help with community engagement and retention? I'm going to ask somebody else, um, Dr. Fields or Christopher Hux Ortiz. <laughs> well, that is true. I, I, I think that um, as a member of the Black, as a member of the Black Caucus, um, you know, we um, worked with the sites to ensure that as part of the community engagement strategies, people were informed of the fact that um, this particular study protocol was designed with black MSM as leadership from the conceptualization all the way through uh, every aspect of the study, uh, not only within the, the, the network, but also involving uh, with community consultations and, and things like that. So um, I do think that that did help with the recruitment and retention. As one of my colleagues in North Carolina would say, you know, that when people realize that uh, the study that they were working on was designed by black gay men for black gay men. It helped them feel like they had more ownership. So I, I think that that was uh, definitely something that we, what part of why we saw the, the benefits of the high levels of retention in the study that we did. Um, Let's see here. Um, there's a question about the uh, indicating indicators or factors about uh, uptake for prep, um, and the question was about site differences. Um, whether you know, and, and if if we can explain why uh, among the sites the slowest rate of uptake was uh, at the Los Angeles site as compared to the other two. From a scientific. Um, um, a perspective, I don't know that I can explain to you fully why there was slower uptake. I mean, because again, men had the opportunity to accept or not accept. What we're doing, and when I say scientific, we haven't analyzed the data to critically address that question, but having followed the study and I'll, throughout its entire inception, men within each jurisdiction made decisions about when or when not to accept PrEP, and the percentages of life circumstances occurring in a man's life, unemployment, incarceration, homelessness, are probably highly correlated with when and how he would have accepted PrEP. And I can say, and, and Mr. Hux Ortiz, please weigh in again because you're at Los Angeles site, there were situations for men in Los Angeles that may have made, made sense in terms of them making a decision about when and how to start PrEP if they were going to stay on it effectively. So um, one of the, no, no, one of the things that we noticed um, in LA, and I, um, I wrote this in the response, the participants at the LA site were on average a little older. The other thing was, at the time when this particular PrEP study was in the field, LA had upwards of seven other PrEP studies also in the field at the same time. So there was a PrEP working group uh, that all of the uh, PIs uh, in the area was a part of, or at least their, their teams. So there was this coordinated effort of directing people to 
uh, different types of PrEP studies that were in the field at the time. So people had a little bit of choice about uh, what study they would initially enroll in. The other thing, too, is, you know, in the community, there, there, there was a, uh, a presence of a uh, strong uh, sort of um, advocacy by some uh, groups against PrEP use. So to the extent that that impacted people's initial choice too is something that um, I, I think might have uh, initially uh, had some people with a slower uptake, at least in LA. This is Ron, I'll, I'll add to that. If you look at, well, you may not be able to see the slide now, but you guys were talking about differences and one site being slow enough to get the other. Really, uh, the site sort of, uh, uptake sort of balanced out by very early on in the study. So if we look at week 12, all the sites had roughly 50 to 60 people enrolled and week 24. So I think patterns of when people were actually recruited could have uh, had an impact on it, but it looks like there was not like a very serious lag in uh, people deciding to take PrEP. Uh, within the first 12 weeks, uh, you see those differences go away. Okay. Um, and there are several questions that I am seeing that are asking more about C4. So I'll highlight a couple of them um, and ask uh, you, Dr. Nelson, if you could speak to more uh, to the elements of a C4 intervention and exactly what the C4 sort of session uh, experience might look like. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, there's really sort of two basic elements. You know, one is, you know, counseling. I mean, C4, a major part of it was risk reduction, counseling, and developing plans with uh, the clients for how they wanted to achieve their risk reduction goals. So, so sites had, you know, the model to go with, but the actual content of the session depends on what the person brought to the session. So uh, the thing that was consistent was how you approached people. Uh, with providing sort of uh, unconditional positive regard with the belief that whatever goal people decided that it was supported, uh, that they could always feel free to return if, if they didn't meet the goal and then problem solve about what else could be done to help them stay uh, on the path towards achieving the things they wanted to achieve in terms of HIV risk reduction. The care coordination piece, it, it also varied by uh, what the needs uh what the needs were, what the client wanted. So the, the components that were consistent across sites were actually how the approach that was done, was the supporting people's autonomy to make the decisions that they wanted to make and being uh, fully supportive with that, uh, helping people master whatever challenges they had uh, in their life situations or leading their risk reduction goals, and demonstrating uh, caring uh, for the clients. Very good, excellent, thank you. Uh, let me see here, some questions are still coming in. Um, let's see. Um, there are some questions about the, uh, uh, any of the serial conversions. Um, uh, can, uh, can we speak more to um, some of the information that we know about uh, the serial conversions in the study. Can you repeat that, Mr. Huxertis? Can we speak? Sure. I, I think it's kind of, you know, relating to, um, you know, obviously we, we've, we've all heard about this, you know, this one experience that came out of Cory last week. Um, and so someone is asking about uh, the, serial, the, the HIV infections um, and, um, and to what degree then um, is there data to support this as uh, an intervention that reduces HIV uh, transmission? I mean, I think the, da the, the, the data in terms of the self-report suggests that we're not seeing significant differences in sexual risk practices. So men were engaging, we saw 73% were having casual partners 
and we're seeing and, and we're seeing f um, relatively few. This was um, serial conversions overall. This was not a population-based study to really power up to do a pop um, uh, to get at true incidents. But incidents within this study suggest that of those who took prep, we see few um, serial conversions. I think it still raises the question um, that was asked initially. Were people actually taking the product? We still have to look at that. And then once we have that information, which again is coming is, is actually in and we're working on it almost as we speak, we do want to drill in and ask the question, what were the characteristics? Who were these men? What are the things? Did their C4 uptake look different? Did their life circumstance look different? Um, because I think that that's the only way we're going to get to an answer to the question that you have. And as I as I caveat it in the beginning of my presentation, knowing that some of the questions would push us um, forward beyond where the current analysis are, they give us great information um, as to what we need to pay attention to as we do additional analysis. So I know it doesn't fully answer the person's question. But I would say from where I sit, it's a great question to help guide how we go into these analyses to make sure we're given meaningful feedback. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Um, here's another question that uh, just came in. Um, and it's asking about the age distribution. So we know that 40% of the men on the study were uh, age 25 or under. And so with the uh, uh, person is, is curious to know is what can we do, what, what what is it that we need to do to get uh, interventions like this into uh, uh, at risk young black MSM um, you know uh, 25 and under or even below the age of 18. Dr. Fields, Dr. Delson. This is a Ron, I I think that you know we still have to really better understand uh, you know how C4 works for folks. You know, as Dr. Wheeler mentioned, you know these data are, are sort of hot off the press, and there's still much more analysis that needs to be conducted. But I think once we really learn about the, the aspects of it that uh, were really important in supporting people's adherence, I think the next step is really how do we you know, scale it up, you know, organizations that target uh, young MSM, the access to programs that have evidence that they that they work in terms of supporting prep uptake. You know, I think I mean, right now we have all the evidence about the efficacy of, of prep as a strategy, uh, but then the next question is how do you get people to utilize that? And, you know, really what this study is saying is that uh, even in places right now where they're finding from a public health programmatic standpoint that PrEP uptake should be, they wish it would be higher in some jurisdictions and some programs, that the conditions uh, of the clinic uh, or the conditions under which men have to seek services and access PrEP matter. And, you know, if we can get programs like this uh, scaled up across the country, I think, and in places that, that actually have expertise, and targeting young black MSM, uh, that that's where you can see differences. But it means that it has to be really done on a, a large scale. And I just might add to that: um, if if you go back to that slide of the peop of the individuals who were under the age of 25, there were 91 of them. 84% accepted prep. So in terms of getting it into the hands, this study suggests that. In fact, you can do just that, that 84% of the individuals under 25 said, yes, I'd be willing to accept PrEP, compared to 16% who didn't. So again, further analysis would lead us to ask the question, what are some of the fundamental differences between those groups who did not accept PrEP, and then if we follow the men who were on PrEP, how did they fare over time? So to do, a, again, a sub-analysis of that younger group. The only thing I would add, additional that I would add to that is I, I think we have to be very careful about subdividing between young black MSM and, and, and older black MSM. 
They serve a purpose in terms of looking at the epidemic in a point in time, but if in fact prevention works at a particular point, a young man under 25 will become a person over 25. And if we're not considering a developmental tra trajectory in terms of how to keep people safe over the entire life course, we're actually passing them through a window into an adult, middle adult, later adulthood where we haven't considered what happens to them later on. And the question for me is, are we just delaying an infection or have we critically considered an entire life course for people to create not just being on PrEP, but ways in which they will be able to advance their capacity to remain negative and to sustain, yeah. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, let me see here. Um, here's a, uh, an interesting question, um, which is um, we know that there was qualitative data that was collected from this, uh, you know, from during the uh, HPTM 073 uh, protocol as well. And the, uh, the person is asking um, whether or not uh, the qualitative data uh, on this important cohort will provide additional insight on perceptions around C4 and PrEP uptake, and, um, and when do we think that that information might be available? Timing of, <laughs> timing of this data, um, I know that Dr. Um, um, Wilton is, may be out there in the, in the universe of participants here, but Dr. Wilton led a phenomenal behavioral component, behavioral science component, and has been leading the qualitative um, analysis. Our focus at this point has been first on answering the core question, which we began to answer today, getting this confirmatory data, and I, I want to say simultaneously, but you know in doing qualitative ana analysis, um, the depth of work is Herculean in some regard. So I don't want to overstep and promise when we're going to do that. But again, maybe, uh, and I think we've done this before, maybe a future webinar where as Dr. Wilton is leading the qualitative data analysis, we could have another webinar that dives into and looks at some of the emerging themes. Um, that will enable us to disseminate very rapidly some of the early findings. Mm -hmm. I don't want to put it on a clock and then we fail to deliver, um, but one of our first and required questions really deal with will men take it, what's the efficacy of it, is it protective, um, and will they sustain on it for um, the life of the study? And that's where we've actually focused our energy in the past two months. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, thank you for that. Um, I'm just going to pull out a couple of more questions here, and then um, what I will mention is that if we do not get an opportunity to respond to all of the questions, every question that has been submitted will be responded to, um, and that will be uh, provided in a document uh, that will go out to the distribution list. So even if we do not have an opportunity to address your question or concern um, within the next few minutes of the webinar, um, your questions are appreciated, and we will make sure that uh, all of those get uh, responded to. Um, so here's one quick question, um, which is about um, uh, any analysis about any other sexually transmitted uh, diseases. So uh, has there been any analysis about acquisition of other STIs uh, during the study just yet? And if so, uh, were there any conclusions about HIV conversion related to other uh, STIs and or condom use? I'm going to hand that off to Dr. Nelson, please, because we definitely are, are in Dr. Fields, because I know we have STI data. We do. If I understand the question, uh, it's asking what we know about it, because we haven't analyzed those yet. Uh, but we do have data on uh, STIs. Correct. Okay, so then it's, the data was collected. We just haven't. It has. It has not yet been uh, analyzed. That's correct. Okay, but it will be absolutely. Yes. 
Um, okay. Well, at this point, I believe that we have about four minutes left. And so what I did want to do was um, actually hand the control of the call back over to doctors, uh, Dr. Wheeler and Dr. Fields for any uh, final um, you know, commentary or uh, points before we, uh, before we finish for the morning. Um, uh, again, this webinar has been recorded and it should be available within about a week on the uh, HPTN website, hptn.org. And if you look under uh, specific, study, uh, specific study protocols, you'll find it um, posted under HPTN 073. Um, and with that, uh, Dr. Wheeler? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Hux Ortiz. Uh, I just again want to say thank everyone for joining the webinar today. Thank you for the questions that you've submitted. Um, they give us great fodder for deeper exploration and thinking about you know, what happens after this study. Um, and again, for all of the support from all those previously identified for making sure that this was a remarkably successful study. Dr. Fields? So, I hope we get. No, I'm still here. Thank you all for your time and participation. The, the study really could not have been done without the collective community support that we had for this uh, effort. Um, what we have begun to do is to disseminate the very beginning um, pieces of the study. There's a lot more to come. Um, there's a lot more data that we need to really delve into. and for the um, upcoming conferences uh, such as the International AIDS Conference and a few more that we were targeting, we will continue to disseminate the results. So stay tuned. Um, and there will also be some publications that, that are coming out as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, Ms. Dr. Fields and um, Dr. Nelson, did you have anything to add as we finish out? No, I'll, I'll just I echo everything that uh, was already said. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Then I, Mr. Hux Ortiz and or our colleagues at FHI 360, are there any closing commentaries? Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the webinar for today. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your lines. Thank you.